These villages are in total isolation. One wall of this valley are the Ganesh Himals, the Himalayan mountains. And the other side of that would be Tibet. These hills are as tough climbing as, as the mountains are. And this is a very, very difficult terrain. It's brutal living here. People here were considered uh, cavemen, or what they call people of the jungle, and were looked down upon. A lot of these folks have absolutely nothing. So many children were dying in these villages. So no government support was here, or services were here. No healthcare, no nothing. And nobody wanted to come up the hill to help them. I tried not to look at children's faces. Sometimes the kids are, well, too far gone. You can't save them. People weren't living very long in uh, rural Nepal. One in five kids were dying by age five, and one in 10 women were dying in childbirth, and their life expectancy was very low. The government had promised medicines for so long, and yet where they live, if you get a fever one day, you could be dead. You just could die up there. They know for sure what their basic needs are. What is next for them? or what would help them, it's kind of lost for them because they're living day to day. But then you ask them a lot, saying, okay, what, is, what do you think would help you in your life? And based on that, we organize our, our efforts to help them with that. We target three main programs, healthcare, education, and income. It's almost about 30 projects that we're doing at a time. And for each of them, there's a committee, a subcommittee, so that the people are involved, so that they make the decisions as stakeholders actually get to say what they want. Yeah, the mission is very simple. It's just help people help themselves. The jargon that most social organizations speak about, but we'd like to actually do it, not just talk about it. the medical treks, we invite international volunteers. Uh, we've had almost 600 doctors come into our program. Many of them come multiple times, some come almost every year. It's as huge as an Everest expedition. There's already an advanced team of 50 porters will be taking almost 30 baskets full of medic medicines and some of the heavier equipments in advance. And then there'll be 50 others who will be with us, carrying the food to the tents, to the tables and the chairs, to get this whole team of people over two high pa mountain passes through snow and ice and what have you. To enter this valley, we call the Akukhola Valley in central Nepal. We have to drive about 10 hours, this winding dirt trail, to get ourselves up to the first camp. And from there onwards, it's walking over passes through the Himalayas. It's not easy. There's only two ways in Nepal, up and down. And very rough terrain. And this is not like a regular trek route, where you have tea houses and trails have been fixed. It goes over these two high passes uh, in the middle of really nowhere. Every step is, you have to be careful where you put your foot down. And also the ledges, they're steep slopes several thousand feet drops, and if you fall off, that's it. To reach this village area called Tipling, Sherpun, Lapa, and Jharlan. Generally, a, a trek will uh, last four to five medical days at these specific uh, villages. It's a good week overall to two weeks to get in and out. During these treks, we'll see anywhere between 800 and 1,000 patients. And that's only one aspect of the, the trek. One of the most important parts of the treks, of these medical treks, is actually doing the educating of the healthcare workers here. And that's one thing we spend a lot of time on. Most important things to us, because we are providing health service for these people. 
Today, my duty is with Dr. Ashika. If he told you um, he has difficulty to start... She teaches uh, more knowledge and skill to me as like a different uh, disease and then how to diagnosis of the problem or disease and the how to treatment, prevention of the uh, disease or other problems. You know, it was almost like having a resident work with me in 24 hours or whenever that was. I'm not going to be there anymore. It's him. So it's a matter of, of him being able to take as much away from what I'm able to provide for him. The stress he must be under 24-7 here, being the only provider in Tipling, called any and all times of the day, and, you know, medical conditions that would make us pause in the United States, then he just tackles them and goes right on. He's fearless. You want that attachment to not be attached to the tooth anymore. Like that, okay? Then you can do the other. What we're going to do today a lot of is her do a lot of the work and me be here to help her and get her through and talk a little bit about what's the right tools to use and how to go about it. I have learned lots of things. Doing easily way for the extension of teeth, I learned how to keep the indulgency. What I love about her is that she's so eager to learn the new instruments and how to use them. She's not afraid. Every time I say, do you want to try something, she always says yes. And it's really fun to see her, the two days we've been working on her, how each day she's getting better and better and more confident. Working with all of these healthcare providers, they get it. That's, that's awesome to see. The healthcare was, I, I would say, the hub of the program. And that's a good start. But with that comes literacy classes. If you don't understand about health and hygiene, and that the connection between them, then it's all lost. We said, okay, the wives are the people we really need to work on, the mothers. They're very receptive, and they're very, they're very concerned of, for the children, for the family, and they're like the, the, the main people in the villages. Help them with toilet building, and about the trends, and about clean water, and, and that's how we started, stepped into literacy class. When we started the latrine project, uh, the women, Groups started getting very excited about it. SSC donate only materials. We made, implement them. They build the, themselves. SSC donated tin roof for the roof, and steel, and cement, fan, pipe, all of material they need when we bought from city. We estimate 25,000 rupees, 300, 350 rupees. Uh, Garo Launi, to Piano Silapo Milani, and they have a Toka Halni, and they have a Comtima, Egmena Pitrama, they get German as a mama, you got the Arunza. Women Empowerment Program is one step more than the literacy program. If we encourage the women in developing works like education and vaccination, about making toilets, about the social awareness, domestic violence. The society really develop. The lifestyle, the living standard will, will be better. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm and they got their source of a dicky leer, Uniago, Kune meeting or in both Funicura. They stay Afno Dicker Sophiani, they stay you just to Ambro Immunizes and Kukura, Poscura, Unsania. Tinia must make them so clear work. Dicky made the Tizig dum provocari dicky at it. It domitins was a just to assert sound on Sunday, and to take a dumb burden is the city of Yako Gauka Mansar, Likuragerson. While the Moina was in dust ponders and the Botsar book, it is in Garna Jan Portuani. I'll let the Bosom make the Botsam more than the one you could have, Unia, Afigers again. I'm the Amamori Gustitis in Petit Rakosin. It dumb will got his a catcher. Rakamashi Parney, 
झारा बगाल लागने तेस कारण मर थो अचार भी मर जाना पारा उपजे कर Over a period of time, we tried 20 or 30 projects. This failed and that failed, and we did pretty miserably. We said, "Okay, income generation. How can we help them make a little more money? So that there's more money at home means more food, and then it's going to help the kids directly in their health." And eventually, we got partners and friends who said, "Okay, maybe this will work." And then we went into environmental handicrafts, and then we got into gold uh, raising and bunch of other stuff. Ponera kati pan cha varza bayo. अभी पैला भा धेरे ऊ भो सहयोग भो इसलिए ये खर्च लीन भर तो लगे मेरा स्वेटर ढाकी ठूल चेयर अला सब तैयार सीखा इन सच प्लेस ब्लैक स्मिथ आर कल्ड अनटच अनटचेबल कास्ट इवन द टैमैंग डोट अलाउ टू कामी इंटर द होम्स Himalayan Healthcare encouraged coming for the education. We provided them sponsorship. Every time we found somebody who has the brains or the talent or the the interest, and we just took those people in and we started training them. So right now we have about eight teachers trained and teaching in the villages. Bahadur Bishwakarma is a teacher now in Sharton. He is the first teacher from a blacksmith family. We're very proud of him. म दुई वर्ष हिमालयन हेल्थ केयर को विद्यार्थी बने मैं चाहे एक क्लास देखि आठ क्लासम पढ़ाऊँ तो जात में मैं जी पढ़े कहीं छेन जिस मैं ये गाँव को ये दलित उदाहरण लिए पक्ष भग म पढ़ा खेल खाली मैं हो पढ़ना अलग सब पढ़ा पर्च पढ़ना पर्च भारणा उदाहरण म बने वहाँ ले हम मैं नाई समाज को लगी ना राो काम कर मैं सब भाग पार्थ पढ़ाने होना क्यों मैं पढ़ाई विद्यार्थी है मंदा मथिलो सीढ़ी में गईस मैं सब भाई खुशी तो नहीं लगता है providing health care in these rural areas is tough enough to begin with it was just compounded many fold with challenges once the malice insurrection and the guerrilla warfare started back in 1996 and lasted to 2006 between 16 and 20,000 that's the estimate died from this guerrilla war and unfortunately many of those were innocent men and women and children it affected not only the rural Nepalese but also us as an organization we had staff members that were kidnapped held ransom we did get them back but we were extorted to get them back the maoists as well as the government forces put pressure on us to not treat the other a uh, warring side telling us that we couldn't do what we were here to do and that was to offer health care for all hhc managed to build a hospital in alam overcoming many obstacles that a war would throw at any organization that's a project that is dear to our hearts because of all the efforts and also because of the time it was started when civil war was so huge and so devastating in nepal we can't allow a civil war to beat us down and we said let's just go ahead and do this So hundreds and hundreds of people showed up to actually participate as stakeholders. It was very touching and heartening to see that people were so involved and so enthusiastic in spite of the civil war. April of 2004, we were able to launch it. It was the beacon of hope for the people then in the midst of all this battle and people dying and and that uh, that even out of all this we have to continue this there's hope here and that's what we persisted with through the darkest moments of this uh war we stuck to what we did best and that was give health care education and income generation opportunities to these villages how him him and health care navigated these difficult times has made me realize you know really what a special organization Himalayan Healthcare is we're resilient we're responsive 
And um, it's one of the more, my more proud moments of being part of Himalayan Healthcare, seeing how we, we negotiated this line we had to walk. I always believe that NGOs are not about empire building. NGOs are facilitators and capitalists, and, and they fill gaps. Times have changed. Uh, since 2006, after the end of the Civil War, new governments have come in. And, um, all the different political parties have come together to write our new constitution. Healthcare and education seems to be something that the government is promising and starting to deliver a little more. As the villages and, the, and Nepal is evolving and changing, we have to change accordingly. Fill in those slots and make up for those deficits so that the people have long-term benefits. We're looking at individual entrepreneurs and see how we can hone their skills and help them write our business plans. And uh, we're going to do that more and more, especially with women. If we train young people to take over a lot of the projects that we do, and they will continue with the work, and that will enhance or create better and bigger things beyond what we have started. I've been in Tipling, where this started in 1992. The leaders of that village community are young people in their 20s who actually been around and grown up in the environment of uh, opportunity provided by Himalayan Healthcare. So now you have a whole set of people who are leading the village and the communities because of the influence of Himalayan Healthcare. So I've really seen firsthand the kind of change that has taken place. One reason I keep coming back to this organization and I'm so committed to it is the work it does. And at the end of the day, uh, the results that we get. Up top, up top. We really made a difference in the lives of the Nepalese in helping them help themselves. You know, every time we come back, there is things that you can see that they've done and, and improvements they've made. And, you know, still there's a whole lot more to do. A lot of NGO and I NGO in Nepal, but they did not succeed because they have no sustainability works. They did not train the local people. They did not share skill in local the local level. But yes, yes, it does it. So yes, this is a very success organization. I think Anil Parajali is the heart and soul of Himalayan Healthcare. It's, he founded it. He's been working day in and day out uh, ever since 1992. He's really got passion for serving the people uh, of Nepal. He has good vision, and he's a kind-hearted man, and he loves the people he's coming and going. And several times, many times, more than 200 times, he walked through this way. He has done a good job of developing a vision to develop health care for villages who have never seen anything like it and good stuff too, not imperialistic culture invasion, but simple stuff, hygiene, toilets, the stuff that really saves lives. Anil is universally very well respected and liked in all these villages. Do You see with the blacksmiths, the commies, that he's educating them where they hadn't been educated before. With women, he's set up women empowerment programs in the villages. This educational component has had direct effect on their health care. We've been able to lower some of the infant mortality rates in some of these villages from 200 per thousand down to about 20 per thousand. The start of it, uh... He knows sort of the next step in the process, and has a lot of great foresight in terms of working with the people and what his next steps are gonna be. So this is something that other organizations, I think, should really look to emulate because it's something that could tremendously change the landscape for care in you know many impoverished rural areas elsewhere in the world. Himalayan Healthcare is proud of what it's been able to do for the people for all these years. But we are also very humbled by all our work. So I don't yeah. see any signs of a secondary addiction. That's much no, better. No, no, no. There's such a thing as altruism. There are people who just like to do things for others. If this comes back, then it should probably... It's the heart more than anything. It's Kathmandu or something. You just have that passion to go help people. We're not doing any rocket science. I've not created any of these things in my head lately. But the passion and the emotion, yes, definitely. That's, that's key ingredient in doing all this. Because without that, it's not gonna work.